Oh, that moves. It's not going to explode, is it? Yeah, that, yeah that's, that's, that's how long you get to interview that's it. Yeah, that's my time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of good. So we don't have to look at you then. We can just look at that. Go. Done. No, done, you're out. Right. There's, a, there's a line that Benji says in the trailer, which is, I find it best not to look. Yes. Is that you, for you as an actor, was that kind of like a watchword in your head in terms of watching when you see Tom doing what he was doing? Because yeah. I've seen him go to the limit before, but this is just out of the stratosphere in some of this. Oh, 100%. And that, that, that was a little meta uh, thing going on there because it, for us, actually on that day, when Tom did the falling from the helicopter stunt, I remember Rebecca and I kind of just not being able to watch because it was, it was very hairy. And um, a lot of the time, it is easier just to kind of go home and let him get on with it and hope that you don't get the call. It was nice to get a call saying it was just his ankle that he broke, you know. I was say, you're waiting for, the, waiting for the day where you, <laughs> you get that yeah. text message. It's worrying. And, 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 and there's, there's, there's not a little... Um, trepidation, you know, it's always, it's always, there's always a slight sense of do on set, you know, but <laughs> here we are. So, I mean, you did the, so much success with The Crown and One Awards and everything else, but then you get a call from Tom Cruise. I mean, when you get the call, do you think someone's pranking me here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someone's taking the piss. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's my best friend being like, uh, putting up own voice. No, uh, it was, it was all quite quick, actually. The first season of The Crown come out and both Tom and Chris had seen it, which is also really surreal. But they're taking the piss. Um, and I met Chris and we chatted a bit and he was like, look, I want to make this, this, you know, little part that's sort of dark and a bit weird and would you fancy it? Um, and then I met Tom and he said the same thing. And I was like, yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, I suppose it was quite surreal, but then within the first day you sort of get used to it and it just becomes like every other set and it's all, it's all less weird. Yeah. yeah. There's only so many times in a career that you get to revisit a character, so it must've been great to go back to Ilsa and to, to kind of peel the onion a bit more and you know more layers with her mm. and discover a bit more. It must have been fantastic to go back. It's, it was wonderful and I didn't expect it because they hadn't really welcomed back any other of the characters previously except the core of them. Um, but yeah, I think she is, there's so many layers to it as you said and I think one of the main things that I love is coming back to the training and to be learning all of these incredible things that we learn and, and get to try out. And the locations and the team and, you know, pegsters. Yeah, exactly. Six pack peg. <laughs> six pack peg. Yeah. Not just Cavill, six pack peg. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. I know you said that you, you felt sorry for whoever took on number six and that ended up being you. Yes. Um, what was your reaction when you got the call from Tom saying, hey, Chris, I think it might be you again? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I did everything I could to talk him out of it. Uh, <laughs> You know, I said the, the, the thing that I was most concerned with, honestly, was that fans of the franchise have come to expect a different director every time. And, uh, and I, I, I pointed out that precedent and Tom said precedents are made to be broken. So I said, OK, well, if I'm going to do it, we need to uh, we need to maintain that aesthetic. It needs to feel like a different director. I need to do whatever I can to uh, to to get as far away from Rogue Nation as I, as I possibly can. Um, and that's not to say I can completely remove my DNA, but I can make a different kind of movie. Uh, and I said, to that end, I want to make a darker movie. I want to make a, 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 a more emotionally complex movie, a more emotional movie in general, and one that's more about Ethan as a person. Did you take much influence from anybody else in terms of coming into this one? Because obviously, as you said, you kind of removed yourself from, from it. Did you take any kind of influence from any other directors or, or films? Well, quite the opposite. I think I, I took a lot of influence from other directors on Rogue. I was having a I was having a fun time making little winks and nods and references and playing with Hitchcock and you know uh, which was a nod to De Palma. Um, and on this one, I very deliberately did not do that. I I did something that I think goes back more to my roots as a filmmaker. It was a little, it was just a little grittier and a little rougher. Um, Rob Hardy, the cinematographer, came to it with influences from things as diverse as The Thing and Point Blank. Wow. Uh, I'm a huge uh, uh, acolyte of um, Gordon Willis and his cinematography, so I think you, I think you see elements of that bleeding through. In terms of writing Ethan, I mean, it is very much Ethan's story, but after so many movies, he's obviously the character's obviously developed quite a lot. What was mm -hmm. it that you wanted to add add into this one? Um, really, what I wanted to do was uh, was be more in his head. I wanted the audience to to feel like they were that they were with Ethan as opposed to trying to figure Ethan out, which is what the previous mission movies had really been about. 
Uh, and when I asked Tom what he wanted to do, he said, you know, I'm still being asked about Julia. The, the, that story is still out there, unresolved for people, and I want to resolve it. And I said, okay, I can do that, but that means I've got to reintroduce her character. You can't assume that people have seen the other movies or retained any of the, the story elements of those. We have to make this a standalone movie. And if that's the case, then the movie's going to start differently than, than an action movie normally does. And that's, that's why the movie begins the way it does. It's a fascinating character. I can imagine that when you read it for the first time, given that McHugh had written it. I keep calling him McHugh. Even I call him McHugh. No, shit. Call really. him McHugh. Um, no, no. Such a fascinating writer and obviously did stuff like Usual Suspects and everything yeah. else. Knew that this was going to be so well written and such a great part to get your teeth into. Do you know what? It wasn't written when we started. Oh. So we didn't know what it would be. And uh, t Tom and McHugh kind of work in this amazing way because they know each other really well. They've done nine movies together, so it's sort of trust. And Mission, you know, the, the narratives are so complicated and there's always so many things at stake and so many people to factor in. And it's a big ensemble, always has been, with Ethan at the centre of it, accomplishing, accomplishing this mission. So they didn't really know what the narrative would be. They just knew the essences or the energies of people that they wanted to add to it, as well as the old ones like Benji and Rebecca and everybody. Um, so all I knew was that she run, she would rent, run this like underground criminal network, that she was probably Vanessa Redgrove's daughter and that she'd be meeting Tom in some way. And so there's lots and lots of different plans of her being a super villain throughout, having this big fight at the end, um, you know, taking everyone down. And there's all these different incarnations of her. So I just got to go and play, really, and just, um, you know, try and find s someone unusual. And I was filming The Crown at the same time, so that was really challenging because it, it was just like two completely different headspaces and I wanted to make someone completely different. Um, and they're sort of both in power as women, but they're just operating in completely different ways. Um, but yeah, she's only sort of in the first third, like floating around Paris, and I just guess I just wanted to do something a bit strange with it. I don't know if it worked, but <laughs> <laughs> just gave it a go. When you were creating the character of Walker, was Henry always in your mind, or did that just kind of come from... Henry was, I will tell you the truth, Henry was always on my mind and I did not bring him up. Uh, I, I, I had Henry in my pocket, and I suspected there might be some apprehension uh, with him being Superman, uh, and and that that would be and that that would overshadow things. So rather than go right down the middle, uh, I I did a dance and I went I, I went down certain roads that I knew we're never going to get this guy, uh, and I and I I exhausted everybody's desires for who they wanted this character to be. Uh, before I finally said, hey, here's an idea. You know, we've tried all of that, and now what if we try this? And, and by introducing that idea gradually, uh, I didn't run into the, 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 the fear of the Man of Steel. And there definitely was some. There was some apprehension at the beginning. But by that point, uh, the, you, know, you, you got people to a place where they're starting to get a little desperate about who are we going to cast in this role. Uh, and, and, and the reason I cast him is I knew... Uh, I knew from having seen him in The Man from Uncle, uh, there was a sense of humor there that, that indicated right away this guy has a darker side uh, that nobody has utilized yet. And, and I think it'll be really interesting to see him as, uh, as something of a bad guy. And what I especially liked about him was so physically imposing. I really wanted somebody who was a physical threat to Ethan. Uh, and, and I didn't quite know what his dynamic was going to be in the story. I had originally started with a different character entirely. And, it, and it, so it became an evolution. Walker was one thing on Monday and another thing on Tuesday and a third thing on Wednesday. And Henry was incredibly patient with it, with me coming to work every day and saying, well, that thing I was talking about doesn't work anymore. I spoke to Chris McQuarrie, McHugh, um, and he said that when he was writing the script, he kind of thought of you and that it would be a very interesting kind of different character for you to play. But then he wasn't sure because of the Superman connection and everything mm -hmm. else. But for you, when you read this part, it must have been great that it was so different uh, and very kind of alluring for you. Absolutely. The It wasn't necessarily a deliberate move, but I want to play something just uh, on the other range of the spectrum. But it was the idea of working with Macquarie and Cruz. And they're very good, they're very good at filmmaking. And so when this character popped up and it was at the other end of the spectrum, it was even more exciting a prospect for me. And when the character started to evolve and get more complex as we went along throughout shooting, it just got better and better by the day. 
I mean, there's so many of these kind of summer blockbusters that are so CGI heavy, but when you see this on, particularly on your IMAX, mm. you see Tom hanging from a helicopter, uh, you get your moment to, to throw down uh, in it as well. Mm. Uh, when you see all these moments, when you see them as an actor and you've, you've kind of removed yourself from it, but then when you see it, I mean, it must be so exhilarating for you, even though you've kind of lived it. Yes, it is. And I, I, I watched the film on Monday in Paris, the first press screening, and Henry and uh, Angela Bassett and myself sort of sat at the back, and, and um, it was extraordinary and, and, and amazing to see 144 days' worth of shooting, you know, compacted into two and a half hours. It was a year for us, but into such a sort of cohesive and, and um, you know, momentum-driven uh, story. It was, uh, it was a, really, a real delight to see it all, you know, finally come to, come to life. I always, whenever I go and see Tom in these missions movies, I always, I always think, how is he going to top himself? And this one, I mean, Doesn't it's just Doesn't topping oneself mean killing oneself off? Well, I mean, it's a double meaning was for Tom. Was that pun, pun Yeah, it was, in the <laughs> yeah. sense that How I is he like, going to top himself off? <laughs> I don't want to read on the news. Like, like Simon Pegg was saying, I got a text saying he broke his ankle, and he thought, oh, my God, you know, I just know. broke his ankle. But he well, just, yeah. he's just so relentless in his pursuit of, of making these movies. I know. And it's funny how, I mean, it's so silly. I said to Simon... And he breaks his foot doing a jump. And he goes, yeah, but do you know how, how, how high up he is? Yeah. That isn't a stunt anymore. In my head, I go, oh, he tripped and fell. You know, it's like crossing the street. Because <laughs> uh, you expect something to happen when yeah. he's, you know, piloting a helicopter upside down or scaling the world's tallest building or falling from the sky. Yeah. Um, but I guess it's also what gives him the kick gives that adrenaline and the rush, and and it is phenomenal being a part of it. It's bloody fun. Yeah. I love the clip of him, I think you were on um, Graham Norton, where the clip that he broke his foot is still oh, in the movie, and he got up and carried on running past the camera. Oh, well, he's, but broke. I think Simon That's said crazy. it so brilliantly. He said, and I think he might have said it to you, he said, he's an actor. He goes, actor, 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 boom, producer, Yeah. when he hits his foot. <laughs> he literally activates producer man who goes, I need to get the shot. I need to get the bloody shot. And he limps, and then he goes, did we get it? And then the rush of adrenaline yeah, kicks in, probably. <laughs> you, you have your own moments, and you get into a bit of a fisticuffs and everything else. But when Tom said to you, this is what we're going to be doing with the helicopter, and then you saw it for the first time, I mean, that must have been... I mean, it's incredible to watch on the IMAX, but when you saw it for the first time, you must have thought, that, that dude's crazy. <laughs> yeah, I did. But, you know, I remember quite early on, before we started filming, Miku, I was in his office, and he was showing me um, simulations of what it would be, because they have to plan it. I mean, I don't even know how they do it. I just, I was actually watching it last night thinking, I don't know how you would do this. I don't know how one does that. It completely blew my mind from all elements of it. Um, but seeing the simulation, I was like, he's, he's crazy. <laughs> like, how the hell is he gonna do that? And he trained for 18 months and then to do it with no one else in the helicopter, just him and the camera. I mean, that's like, like seriously endangering your life. So yeah, he survived. Don't know how. I would be down in a minute. I mean, like, less than that, 10 seconds. How was it shooting on IMAX cameras? Because I know when um, Chris Stone did Dark Knight, he was kind of the first kind of trendsetter to do it, and he found that he had to kind of go back to film school and learn different yeah. things. Oh, what was the most challenging thing about doing IMAX? Because it's very different than if you did it on 35 or 70 millimeter, I guess. Yeah, well, in, in our case, the stuff that we did for IMAX, I don't know how nerdy the people are watching this. We didn't shoot on IMAX film cameras uh, for a simple practical reason. Uh, we needed the lightest possible cameras because the two sequences that we were shooting were the helicopter sequence and the halo jump. The halo jump required an extremely small camera. It's mounted on the head of a, of a skydiving cameraman. And the helicopters needed to have the lightest weight possible. And they also needed to be digital simply because we didn't have uh, we didn't have the ability to reload as often as we wanted to. We could put larger uh, drives on the cameras and roll for much longer time because any time you had to turn around to go back and reload the camera was enormously, enormously time consuming. Uh, so we ended up shooting digital and not uh, IMAX film. And I was very apprehensive about that because I'm I'm a huge lover of film and I was concerned that the change from one format to another was going to be too jarring, but it actually it actually worked really well. 
And there's, I mean, there's so many amazing stunts in this movie. Um, uh, the thing I love about it is that Tom and, and uh, Chris are very keen on you know, the realism and everything else. And you can see that there's one sequence where you're in a helicopter and you can see all your hair going, which is like, oh, that's, that's really real. Um, there are people out there who th probably say, oh, he's been Superman, he can do all this stuff. But actually, I can imagine Superman is very different to, to doing this because it's kind of make-believe in, in some ways. Absolutely. There's, there's a lot more in the way of CGI takeover fights because it is superpowers and people are doing superhuman things. And there's a lower level of stunts in, in the superhero movies, in the ones I've been in anyway. And this is all practical stunts and practical locations. And so the training required for it is, is extra months. It's, it's wire work, it's, it's rigs, it's being in helicopters. It's the kind of thing which Superman doesn't do. I don't think he would ever be in a helicopter, would he? <laughs> well, no, that would be... Yeah, deep, unless it was purpose, Batman's helicopter. Yeah. <laughs> just being Batman's polite. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, 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 that itself must give you such a great kind of platform to do different stuff because you're used to being superhuman, whereas in this, it's like, right, I've got to proper get down and dirty with this one and yeah. do what Tom's doing. <laughs> Absolutely. And I loved it. I loved it. I, I saw it as a wonderful opportunity to do this kind of stuff. I've always wanted to get stuck into the stunts and just stretch myself that way. And when I turned up on this set and spoke to Wade Eastwood, the second unit director and stunt coordinator, I said to him, look, put me in, coach, anything. I, I want to do it all. I always assume I'm going to say yes. And, and they did. How infectious is it to be around Tom Cruise? Because he's such a professional, but also seeing him at the premiere, he wants to meet all the fans, yep. he wants to do all of that. As an actor, when you're around him, he must be such a, a great kind of person to, to look up to because he's so professional, but also, I mean, he, he gets himself in there. Yeah, he's he sets a wonderful example. What I'm taking from this movie especially is that physicality isn't just enough to get you through all the stunts and everything. There's a huge amount of skill sets that are required. And he set that example as a leader and set the bar so high that I now look at it and I'm, I've left this movie thinking I need to, in my own time, get a whole bunch of skills. Helicopter flying will be one of them. I got a motorcycle license on the job and, and by myself as well. It wasn't sort of part of the job because the one bit which required my motorcycle license was right at the beginning of the movie and I was kicking myself the entire time thinking I, I knew I should have got my license years ago and I didn't because I didn't think it was going to have a practical a, a use in, in my profession. And now I know otherwise, yeah. and I've got the bug. I've really enjoyed the evolution of Benji because he started out as this, you know, you were in a couple of scenes in Mission Possible 3 yeah. with, with JJ and behind a computer. Yeah. And now to go where, where he's gone is, I mean, it, it, some actors don't get to reprise characters. You've done it four times and he's getting more yeah, stuff to do every time. The average lifespan of a, of a field agent is not that long. So to, to become an agent and stay an agent for, for four films has been, uh, for three films, has been really fun. And to play his evolution from kind of, you know, nerdy tech to um, nerdy secret agent has been, has been a real pleasure. There's a fantastic camaraderie between you guys. And one thing that I know a lot of people will obviously say how great Tom is, but he's such a good, he's so good at comedy. Mm. And he's great in Tropic Thunder and a few other things. But in this, he's fantastic. And all of you guys kind of, was that kind of an improvised thing? Was he very open to improvising or something? Yeah, Tom likes playing. I mean, Tom, I think Tom, you know, he's known for doing stuff like hanging out of helicopters and piloting them into his tailspins and that. But he's also extremely good at playing vulnerable. Some of his best performances throughout his career have been when he's played not cocksure kind of maverick characters, but characters like Jerry Maguire or even his character in Edge of Tomorrow, which is a sort of flawed coward at first, you know. And in this film, Ethan is suffering a crisis of confidence about his life and about his work. And Tom lets that creep into that bravado in really nice, subtle ways, which just make Ethan feel so much more human you know, he's a kind of a superhero, Ethan Hunt. But in this respect, you know, in this film, he's starting to doubt if that's the case. And even if he is, if he's any good at it, you know. And the other thing I loved about this is that it, obviously you delve more into character, but more of her and Ethan. I think there's a, a quite a big section of the fan base that was always kind of like willing you two to kind of be together, but also knowing that it probably wasn't written in the stars maybe yeah. I mean did you did you did you feel that that in you were stars. gonna I know right <laughs> um I think had they ended up together it would have kind of killed the magic um of what they are um the word lone wolf is such a boring term but I'm gonna use it because they are they're, they're quite lonely people within their brilliance both of them they obviously have their team and their collaboration etc but 
when they meet, there's such chemistry within their knowledge and their range of, of capacity. Um, but also they have goals and they have their needs, but they will do anything to achieve it, even if it is breaking each other down. Um, and it's kind of a love-hate relationship, which is really fascinating. Yeah. It's always what keeps people apart, even though there's that magnetic feel between them. Yeah. Um, and you're well prepared for your next film, which I'm sure people have asked you already, to go and throw down with Jason Statham and, and The Rock. You're kind of, this is kind of a good like, audition, isn't it, for that? Do you know what? It's not definite yet, so I can't, oh. I can't, um, I can't send it anyway because, you know, we're not, I'm not sure if it's going to be able to work out date-wise. But, um, yeah, it's... Um, what I can say is, is I have never read such a fierce character in any of those kind of movies ever as a woman. And it's really exciting because I think it's so important to for women to have absolute to be the match for the man in these kinds of movies, particularly because it's always been male-led protagonists in these movies. And I, you know, I've, I've said it so quite a lot recently. Actually, I, I think that you know, for for little girls going to cinemas watching these kind of movies, how different they'll feel if they feel as a woman on screen. That's absolutely, you know as fierce as the men, if not more, in terms of whether it's action or anything. And I, I do you know what? I never imagined I'd be in action movies. <laughs> um, I'm just not naturally that athletic or coordinated, for number one. And um, I just, it wasn't a genre that I imagined that I'd be doing. But um, I, I understand the importance of, no matter what it is, whether it's stage or, you know, The Crown was really, really profound for me because it was one of the first times that I was played a proper protagonist on screen where the men were in a relationship to me. And that's not to say that it shouldn't be the other way around too, but um, I didn't realise how empowering it felt to have a fiancé join me as opposed to be someone's fiancé. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and you understand actually the importance of subverting that and changing that as much as possible and representing that. Um, and um, yeah, that character takes everyone down around her. Including Idris Elba. <laughs> oh, and Idris <laughs> as well. Cool. It's a good mm. cast. Listen, thank and you so much Helen for your Mirren time. And actually, as well. So. It's a pretty good lineup. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so Who much knows? for your time. Oh my. Did you, I don't know if you noticed this, but maybe it's just me making it up, but there's a, there's a sequence in the movie where he jumps over a hedge. And I just, it kind of Is reminded that? me of, of Shaun of the Dead, where you jump over the, the fences and everything. And oh, it yeah, looks yeah, very yeah, similar. Yeah, 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 I just yeah. wondered whether that was something that you kind of knew about or whether no, that's just me being so. a, a fanboy. You've seen, <laughs> seeing connections that aren't there. Someone also says the greater good in this film. I said to McHugh, you know, we take the mick out of that in half fuzz. Like, it's all right. <laughs> uh, just finally, I know I've asked you before about uh, Star Trek. They've announced today that someone from Black Panther might be in Star Trek 4. Are oh, you, really? Uh, Denia Gray, who plays... Oh, I love her. She's right in The Walking Dead. Woman. She's in talks, apparently. Yeah. Um, do you know if you're any closer? Because I know Zachary Quinto has said that you might be shooting very, very soon. You have got a director and new writers and everything. SJ Clarkson's coming tonight, so you can oh. ask her. That'll be good. I'll write that down. <laughs> she knows more than I do. <laughs> Are you hopeful, though? I can imagine, yeah, as you were so yeah, involved absolutely. in the last one, as that you get to know, do it again. We're, we're pushing ahead. We're in prep, I think, for it. So... You know, but then there's so much to do before we actually start shooting, like making sure everybody is available. But um, yeah, that'd be great. That's a nice little uh, bit of information. Thanks. There we go. I'm the first person to tell you, man. Yeah. I guess if you were to do seven, I guess space for Tom Cruise. I'm trying to think Lower Earth orbit, at the very least. We, we tried <laughs> to get, we wanted to see the curvature of the Earth in the Halo <laughs> sequence. And we discovered uh, just how high you have to go to do that. And it's much higher than 25,000 feet. <laughs> Uh, and we were kind of disappointed. We were like, oh, God, I really wanted to see that. Uh, and Tom and I talk about it. We were talking about it last night, about uh, a sequence like that. And he said, and this is what's great about Tom. He didn't say, oh, yeah, we've got to do that. He said, but why would I be there? Like, the, 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 the challenge of these sequences is creating a realistic purpose for why he has to do the things that he does. Uh, so whatever happens in mission 7 it's going to start there it's going to start with what's a what's a even remotely believable reason for putting this character in that situation well, I hope you do it. I love the movie. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you Absolute so much. Pleasure. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much. Uh, just finally, I want to ask you about, um, they've just announced that you might be in the Shining sequel, Doctor Sleep, with yeah. Ewan McGregor, which is fascinating because I'm such a huge fan of The Shining. It's a long time, but... It's fascinating. It's an interesting a, word you use. Yeah, it's, it's bloody fascinating terrifying, isn't it? If it is, I mean, you've obviously read the scripts and stuff. Is it something that The Shining... Obviously, it's been a long time, yeah. but there's so much excitement now that we're getting... Do you know what? Up. It is a great script. And uh, Mike Flanagan is a fantastic director, and he has cast very well. 
Um, I, I, for me, we've just started this production, so we haven't really, I'm diving into my character and finding out little things that I want to do and just sort of what kind of a hat do I want? You know, she's called Rose the Hat. Um, but I want to see it and I see it as a separate entity to The Shining. I don't want people to see that it's a continuation. Um, they do go in line. There are lots of assembling milieus, which is bloody exciting for me, um, not to spoil anything, but they are separate as well. And he wrote it 2013, I think. Oh, wow. So Very it's a new film, yeah. I have to ask you about Superman. I mean, I'm such a huge fan of Man of Steel. Uh, and then obviously, I think you said, you know, you would love to go back and do a sequel because it, it kind of changed to Batman, Superman, and everything mm -hmm. else. I'm sure you don't know, but are you keen to revisit Superman in his own world, you know, do a Man of Steel sequel if you can, revisit him, revisit him and Lois and everything else? Because I think there's so many people out there that want to see another Superman movie. I would love to make a Superman movie, absolutely. I would love to draw from all of my favorite comic books and, and, and make an original story there which is based in the essences of those characters and have that, have that joyful, hopeful, powerful figure um, who Superman is, which, and not, not just like the chocolate box sort of, you know, saving kittens and stuff. A little bit of that, absolutely, but also the badass version of Superman. Superman who, who you see his, his raw power not necessarily unleashed in a negative way, but you see it in the protection of other people. And that's the kind of stuff, I, I would love to do it. Yes, I could, I could wax lyrical, I, I will <laughs> calm down. Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a huge uh, fraction of the fan base who saw uh, do these kind of reaction videos to the trailer and see you doing your, cocking your fingers and everything else. People, A, excited to see you doing that, but also a lot of people reacting as like, oh, where's that Superman? I want to see that Superman. Not in the sense of right. him going around and being yeah. evil, but like yeah. just that, as you say, that, that power. So there, it must be great to hear that people actually want to see you do what you want to do. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. And um, it's, it's very encouraging. And it would be, be wonderful to get the opportunity. I hope you do. Thank I'm you. Very excited. Thank, Thank you. you so much for your time. Thank Absolute you. Pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys. Hey, you guys, huh? Hey, you guys. Is yeah. that from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice. Hey! hey.